Okay, so hi to everyone. So first of all, I would like to thanks again the organizer for this amazing uh, program and the conference. So I have learned a lot about galaxy formation and evolutions and the new tools that we can apply to this field of research. My name is Elena Giusalma. I'm an assistant professor at Michigan Tech. And I'm a cosmology, so I'm in a different, a little different field of, uh, uh, a little different. So I'm almost uh, used, uh, um, I'm also uh, interested in uh, um, the interplay between data and the theory, and I'm also interested in applying machine learning tools to the cosmological problems. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk. So I will start with a very uh, brief introduction of the cosmological uh, models and how do we infer the uh, parameter estimation in cosmology. And then I will move to the second part of the talk in which I will show you some results on how to apply machine learning tools to uh, cosmology. Okay, so we all know that we are living in an expanding universe, and we also know that our universe is almost made by dark energy, so about 68% of dark energy, then 26.8% of dark matter, and just 5% of ordinary matter, so bios matter. And the good thing is that this model is well described by just six cosmological parameters that are the density of matter and baryons, so the uh, expansion rate of our universe, so the age of the universe, and the amplitude of the uh, primordial fluctuations. Now, we have the model, but we also have a bunch, uh, amount of observables. For example, we have the cosmic microwave background radiations, that is the residual radiation of the Big Bang. We have the large-scale structures, we have galaxy lensing, we have CMB lensing, and other many observations. Now, we have data, and we also have uh, our model, so how can we infer the parameter estimation? So, we uh, calculate the summary statistics. The most common as is the power spectrum, so here we have the uh, angular, the uh, CMB temperature power spectrum, and here we have the matter power spectrum, that is just the uh, Fourier transform of the two-point correlation function. Okay, so the uh, CMB power spectrum just described how the amplitude of the temperature fluctuation vary with the scales, and uh, we can see in both of cases the line corresponds to the theoretical models that uh, is just described by six cosmological parameters, and the points are our data, so the come the, the Planck data and the large-scale structure data, and we can see that this model uh, the, uh, uh, the data fit very well our model, our cosmological our model. So once we have the uh, summary statistic, we can just apply a, a Bayesian parameter inference, okay, to derive the posterior probability distribution using Markov Monte Carlo chains. Now the thing is that okay, we have this model, we can derive this posterior probability distribution, but in order we want the high accuracy for our parameters. And we usually, what we do, we just combine the different observables together, okay, to obtain the high accuracy of the cosmological parameters, but also to break some degenerality between those parameters. Unfortunately, okay, this is uh, a good accuracy, but we still have some problem because we don't have precise uh, theory, okay, about what's happened at the nonlinear scales or small scales. So the important question is, uh, how should we compare theory versus observation. So um, how can we extract the maximum amount of information from data if uh, we don't have a precise theory at nonlinear scales? A way to do that is by using, of course, numerical simulations. So we are talking about here about non-numerical astrophysical and cosmological simulation in general. So simula simulations are uh, uh, very important if you want to make prediction of theory, if you want to generate mock of data, to compute the covariance matrices, to make data analysis, but also to uh, optimize the observational strategies for future experiments. So in this talk, I will just focus on numerical simulation and body simulation. So this is uh, uh, it just consists of the evolution of dark matter particles under the effect of the gravity. We have a large amount of end body simulation. So for example, we have Quixote, Emulus, Abacus, Uchu. And those simulations are very accurate, so they are high resolution simulations, but they are also very expensive. So just to take an example of Quixote simulation, Falco can confirm what they say. So these are like thousands of high resolution simulations with the different cosmology and different astrophysics. And in order to obtain this one pair of petabytes of data, we need about 35 million CPU hours for running all of the simulations. So these are accurate but very expensive. 
An alternative to end body simulation is by um, running the fast approximate simulations, okay? Those are, uh, we use those kind of simulation if we want a large number of simulation for our analysis, but those simulation are uh, um, less computationally expensive, but also less accurate. An example are in scholar simulation, this is the Comovi Lagrangian acceleration methods, that use the uh, second order Lagrangian perturbation theory on large scales and, uh, and body simulation on small scales. So here is an example of the results from scholar simulation. Another alternative, so just to mention that, is by using emulators. So emulators are uh, uh, surrogate models for n-body simulations, okay? And are very useful to um, determine the sum of statistics, for example, the power spectrum. So this is the basic emulator setup. So we have a sampling scheme, like a Latin hypercube uh, sampling. We make some interpolation and we obtain our outputs, okay? This is an example of the emulator of uh, the power spectrum obtained by Euclid collaboration. We also have here many um, emulators available. We have Hemulus, Cosmic uh, uh, Emu, Frank, Franklin Emu, Euclid emulator, Buckle emulator, depending on the problem that we have in cosmology. Now the question is, okay, we have uh, high resolution numerical simulation that are expensive, and we also have fast approximation. So now the question, can we use a new tool to generate those high, uh, high resolution simulation that are also less computationally expensive? So can we use machine learning tool in order to do that? And this is what we have done with my PhD in Ralph Kaushal at Michigan Tech, so he's now graduating and he's working as a, a deep learning scientist for a, a biotech company in Boston. So we did, together with Healing and Falco, so we uh, tried this. So we had fast approximate simulation, so we take color simulation, and we predict end body simulation using convolutional neural network, so using the VNet. So our input are color simulation and our uh, output is end body simulation. Those are the results. So this is the um, cold dark matter density fields. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the uh, end body simulation that is our target. Cola is our input and N, N E cola is our uh, output, so our model. So we call it uh, N E cola. So if we look on large scales, we cannot see pretty well the difference, but if we zoom in on small scale, we can see that the output of polar simulation is more diffuse with respect to n-body simulation. While if we compare it with n e cola, we can see that n-body simulation, so our target and our prediction are in, uh, in very uh, good agreement. I want just to point out that this is not just the first attempt to apply field level cosmological emulators. So the pioneer work was by Siyu uh, Shirley Hu and Yiling in 2019, but there are also other works that now are trying to uh, simulate, okay, the, um, and to, to, to predict and body simulation with the machine learning tools. Okay, so we have these results and we use the summary statistics to, in order to quantify, okay, what we obtain. So in particular, we use the power spectrum, the transfer functions and the cross correlation function and the cross correlation coefficient. So here we can see, okay, our uh, target is the black line that uh, here is not uh, very visible, but here, here in the transfer function, that is the um, n-body simulations. Then we have our input that is cola simulation. The uh, benchmark model, the green line, that is uh, uh, um, the Tizal Zeldovitz approximation, so it's the first order perturbation theory. And then we have our output that is any cola, so the red line, that uh, uh, red dash line. And we can see that our models is in agreement with the, the input that is the black line, or certainly with the target that is the black line at uh, all the scales, up to scale of 0.1 uh, uh, h of a megaparsec. So it's uh, outperforming our benchmark model. We also calculate the summer, uh, the bias spectrum, okay? We also obtain very good results here between the, the target that is the, uh, the black and the, uh, the red line. But the good thing of our model is the, that it is able to generalize to different cosmologies. So what we try to do, we try to test our model on a set of 100 simulation with different cosmological parameters, okay? So we test our simulation, uh, our model with some uh, simulation that is never seen. 
okay? And this is our results, so in this middle panel. So we can see that our models, it's performed very well at all the scales and with the error that is lower than 1%. And it's even better than the, the Lovitz approximation. We also try to include some extending cold dark matter models, for example, including neutrinos with a different mass or some dark uh, energy equation of state parameters, okay? And we can see that also, also in this case, we obtained a very good results uh, with an error that is lower than 1%. So this is a very amazing uh, uh, result. Now the question is, okay, we have these um, with the standard uh, um, models. So the question is, can we extend, okay, this approach to um, no standard model. So because we are also interested in looking at the deviation from the standard model. For example, if we want to understand the neutrino properties, okay? So we did that. So just to um, briefly summarize, so what we want in cosmology, we want to understand how many neutrinos do we have in our universe, what is their total mass, and what is also the individual mass. For the moment, we just focus on the total mass of neutrinos. And why we want to learn that? Because neutrinos are the only known particles that behave as radiation at early time and uh, uh, as matter, as non-relativistic particles at late time. So they affect, uh, um, they also have small interactions, so they have very, very weak cross-section, and they have high uh, velocity, they, they also have a high velocity dispersion. So they are the only known candidate for the hot dark matter. For those reasons, they also affect different cosmological observables, and in particular, they affect the matter power spectrum, so they suppress the matter power spectrum of small, of small scales. And we can see this effect in this simulation running by Paco. Oh, sorry. So we can see here, I don't know how to start. Okay, here. Um, okay. how dark matter clusters Okay, and how neutrino cluster, so they cluster very slowly, okay, so this, this load how structure falls, okay, this is the effect. So, and what we did here, so in this project, together with Paco and Shirley Hu, is, okay, so we have standard neutrinos, standard simulation without neutrinos, can we predict simulation with massive neutrinos with neural networks, okay, with the new net? And in particular, we predict simulation with this given mass, 0.50 EV. So we run our algorithm and we obtain this output. So this is the power spectrum. So the um, red lines is uh, our input, the uh, black line is our output, uh, our target, and then the blue line is our models. Okay, we can see from the transfer functions, okay, that our models uh, is in agreement with uh, the um, uh, with the, the uh, target, so the black line, at scales between 0.1 and 0.6, so between linear and mildly nonlinear scales, okay? If we go, we verify that if we go to um, nonlinear scales up to 1 h, h, megaparsec, h over megaparsec, we obtain uh, uh, the agreement uh, is start to, the, our model starts to deviate from the, uh, from the target of about 6%, 6-7%. So it's not pretty good, this model at nonlinear scales, but it's a state-of-art um, model. We also obtain very good results for the bispectrum. And now the question is, okay, we have this. The question is, uh, can we now generate um, neutrino, and can we generate simulations with the neutrinos with a difference range of mass, okay? From zero, like, I don't know, 0 0.8, or one, uh, uh, one, one uh, electron volt. So in order to do that, this is a work that I'm doing with my new PhD and together with NRAV, so it's by using a conditional generative adversarial networks. So what we wanna do here is, okay, we, our model will condition the generator and the discriminator, okay, on, on the top of some condition that in our case is the neutrino masses, okay? So what we have is we have the input of the generator that is some random noise, okay? That is um, big emissions like a, a latent vector. And then we also uh, put as the input the conditions on the neutrino masses. And the generator just generates just some fake data. After that, we also put our fake data in the discriminator together with the real data, so simulation with the massive neutrinos. And we have some score, okay, the X and this DGZY. Uh, 
So then these predictions is uh, compared with some true labels and we determine the loss function that then is back propagated through the discriminator and through the generators and we adjust the weight and the, uh, and the biases in order to obtain the final images. So we do that. So we run some simulation with COLA from different neutrino masses and we use it for these uh, conditional GANs. And this is, uh, um, this is our results. So we can see that, uh, okay, here is uh, what we have from end-body simulation and here, here we, is what we have from GANs, okay, new GANs. So we, we can see that the, the, our model can predict, okay, the uh, Kodak matter density fields, okay. We cannot distinguish here between, we cannot see the effect of massive neutrinos from those images because it's not visible by eyes, okay. But we can see that he's starting to predict pretty well the, the, uh, the cosmic web. We try to see, to quantify this prediction, so we calculate the power spectrum. At this moment, those are very preliminary results. In particular, if we look here at the um, transfer functions, okay, we can see that uh, our prediction, that is the... Um, the, uh, red, the red line and uh, our truth are in agreement between 5%, so within 5%, <laughs> up to mildly linear scales, about 0.5, okay? But then at non-linear scales, we can see that our prediction are not very, very well. There are some oscillation with that we still not understand, okay? And so it seems that uh, the end result is, is a little bit larger with respect to the previous approach, but we're still in agreement to the fact that we can cover the non-linear the, uh, linear and multi nonlinear scales. Now, what next? So here I have been talking with a few people and uh, I've got some idea of how can I can approach this problem. So of course I can try to um, train, we can try to train our model with the neutrino mass mass differences but we can also use the uh, score-based generative, uh, um, generative models that we have seen about that yesterday with Salston. And the good thing of this model is that, okay, we can, we can use this model for the 2D um, images, but we can also use directly the 3D box, okay, and use it for, uh, um, for generating the, uh, the simulation. And another thing that also plan, we plan to do is uh, use normalizing flow to constrain neutrino masses directly from the, um, from the density fields, the cold dark matter density field. So here to conclude, what we saw is that, okay, we want to improve our understanding of the fundamental constituents and the laws that govern our universe. And we know that the answers are written in the sky, in the data, okay? So now also from, I also saw here from uh, this uh, program and uh, the conference that we can actually use a machine learning tool, deep learning algorithm, to improve our interpretation of data, not just cosmological, but also maybe in uh, astrophysical data in general to understand our universe. And we also see that a way that we can use this, uh, um, this machine learning tools is maybe to predict accurate and complex end body simulations in order to, to be used for future cosmological analysis. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you, Alina. Do we have any question? Hi. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, this is Matt Howe. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of this work and um, the consistency, consistency that you're seeing is really remarkable. Um, I know one problem with these big 3D units is the GPU memory restri restrictions. Like you can only go to so fine of a grid before you run out of memory. Um, have you tried, uh, like, playing with that at all? Like, um, patching your generation or your unit over the 3D cosmological volume and seeing if it's consistent? No, um, no oh, I didn't okay. try that, but okay. maybe this is, could be a good test. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank thanks. You. Uh, John Wood here. Um, yeah, thanks again for the talk. Um, so I'm curious when uh, you were showing the results comparing, say, the power spectrum of, you know, your n-body simulation versus the emulated uh, improved, you know, uh, like a second-order approach, um, is when you uh, make your loss function, is there any 
like direct penalties against you know errors in the power spectrum or, or, or the by spectrum or anything like that or are you just purely trying to reconstruct no we're just pretty trying to reconstruct yes the, okay so, you, so so that comes out of it directly yeah, yeah. that's very interesting okay mm -hmm. yeah thank you Hi, uh, Natalie Desange here. Uh, I'd like to know, every time that we have this kind of works, people never come back to do like the Bayesian uh, thing to try to do MCMC to recover the, the cosmological parameters. Why not? Okay. Why you always stop like analyzing like uh, the fractions of the power spectra and so on and not so, only like try to come back to see the cosmological parameters? So what, because, what, what, sorry, what, what, Ah, you mean to apply the MCMC directly? Yeah, to the, to yeah, the yeah, spectrum. Yeah. Why not? Why people just stop there? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's a long one. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, there's a number of reasons. Um, I mean, the main one is that the end body simulation still needs a lot to actually look like the data. So you have to add things like Firstly, paint galaxies on, on halos, realistically, which is what a lot of this conference is about, but also like the masking, the observational systematics and so on. That's, it's something that we're trying to do in, in the Learning the Universe collaboration, but it's, it's, a, it's a big undertaking. The other limitation is that you don't have a likelihood function because um, you don't have errors. So that's why we do this um, likelihood-free inference in which you're trying to learn the likelihood as you go. Um, so if you did that, I mean, when you do that, you're basically learning a likelihood and doing MCMC on the likelihood that you learned. But um, but it's 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 still a big like this is crucial, but it's still a big step to go from this to to parameters. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Maybe also to add to this, I mean, sometimes in some collaboration, like for instance in Euclid, we only require like one percent to be convert the power spectrum down to k of ten. So if you only care about this, that's it. And, you know, that's a little bit what you are doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, this is a comment. I'm referring to Pablo's point. But there's an ongoing work which is trying to take the derivative. There, basically use one of these uh, emulators, take the derivative through the emulator, and then through the differential like particle mesh simulator to do Hamiltonian Monte Carlo on the initial conditions. Um, that's something that's actively worked on in the board collaboration and I'm kind of involved in that. So if anyone wants to talk about that. Yeah. I have one question for Elena. Ah, yeah. So ha have you thought, you know, instead of applying this to embody to use this maybe for hydro simulations? For so neutrinos, you, can... you mean? So no neutrinos. So in general, you know, I mean, you, you show that you can go from a fast simulation like COLA to the full embody. But go from, I mean, from end body to hydro? So what do you mean? Let's say even a, a, an approximate hydro to a full hydro. That ah, would yeah. be super useful. Yeah, too. yeah, this could be also super useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'm now just, and we will just focus on end body because I'm also interested in, ex, in uh, uh, yes, extending dark matter model, but yes, this of course could be very useful. Mm -hmm. All right, so if we don't have any other question, let's thank Alina again. Thank you.